Small business war stories. Small businesses are the soul of America. And this is where they tell their stories. I am your host, Pablo Fuentes. Hey, lovers of small businesses and good stories in general. Welcome to Small Business War Stories with Calton Cases here in Austin, Texas. And I just sat down with Robert Steele. Calton Cases, really, if uh, if you have an instrument like a, a, a guitar or some sort of instrument that you need to fly with uh, or that needs to go on tour on the road, um, the regular guitar cases won't really cut it. So you need to uh, look for something stronger and that is a Calton case. Um, Calton cases originally started, um, I mean, we, we do, he's going to go into it. I don't want to steal his thunder, but it was not originally started here in Austin. It was started somewhere else. And then eventually they, um, you know, moved production to Austin, Texas. And we talk a lot about what it means to do uh, manufacturing here in the U.S. He has lots of funky, cool stories about different celebrities and different people that, uh, and things that have happened in the course of making guitar cases. So it's really a cool, cool episode of Small Business War Stories. This episode is brought to you by Proven. Proven is the company that I started. It is a small business hiring tool. So if you need to hire for your small business, go check it out. We help you get your job post out there and get all the applications in one place. We also have a great resource section at blog.proven.com where you can learn more about different things that can help your small business. Without further ado, let's get into today's episode with Robert Steele of Calton Cases in Austin, Texas. And we are live here in beautiful Austin, Texas, in very sunny, beautiful fall afternoon. And today I have the pleasure and honor to sit down with Robert Steele, who is their mastermind do-it-all gentlemen here at Calton Cases. <laughs> I told you I'd make up a good title for you. Yeah, that's, yeah, sure. Mastermind that's do it all. <laughs> that, that's me. <laughs> that's you. Um, but yeah, thanks for having me. I, I've always, I've known about your product for a long time and I've been to an event here uh, at the Fretboard Journal um, yeah, yeah, event you guys had here. Nice, nice event we had. It was awesome. For Ham, that was great. It was awesome. Ham, for our listeners who may not know, is the Health Alliance for Austin Musicians, correct? Yeah. Yeah, and it's a, it's a really cool nonprofit in Austin that provides health care for musicians who otherwise would probably struggle to, to buy health care. Sure. Yeah. And that's important. So that, that was a really cool event. And uh, I've known you. I mean, your cases are iconic in the music business, and we'll, yes. we'll get a little bit into into that. But, uh, I mean, let's, let's start with, you know, what you guys make and why that's important. So what I mean, you guys make... What I would call like you know the hardest core possible yeah. guitar case in the business, right? The hardest core and beautiful, I think. Yeah. To me, the combination of the of both. There's some hardcore ones out there that are big boxes that are meant for stacking. And yeah, the ones that look like you could drop them for a helicopter. Like and stuff but like these that. are beautiful. Yeah. Handmade. Um, little, you can drive a truck over them. They're like custom built to every instrument That's that beautiful. goes in them. So very uh very nice that's cases. awesome that's awesome and uh so there's you know before i started playing you know more seriously a number of years back um you know i would have wondered why do you even need that hardcore a case right, right. so why why do why do people need heavy duty guitar cases oh uh, you could you should see how they one there's plenty of videos online where yeah Airlines throw them out of planes. What's it called? United Breaks Guitars, right? United Breaks yeah, Guitars. That's the thing. Yeah, look, that. look that up on YouTube. It's pretty funny. I mean, there's many videos of, of them being thrown out of planes. But then the conveyor belt system that planes have really can do a number on them. Uh, a lot of people are playing, you know, a lot of these are acoustic dread, you know, large acoustic guitar cases. So you can't carry it in an overhead you have to check it if you're touring a lot you're traveling through the airlines they're going to take a severe beating uh, we had one recently that fell off of the back of a truck on the on the runway here in austin and get run over Whew. by a luggage truck behind it guitar survived it was a j200 gibson and survived that's a hell of a story to tell 
We've had many backed over by trucks. And Man, people need to know. They'll leave their guitars behind their just trucks. Just a lot can happen <laughs> on the road. So yeah. it, if you ever have to travel with it yeah. extensively, you, you start to really realize that it's something you like need if you're going to show up with your instrument. Yeah. To play somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Now we're here in Austin, and you guys have an awesome manufacturing facility here. And we'll talk a little bit about American manufacturing and what that means uh, a little bit later on. That's been a theme that I've I've talked to a lot of people around the country. But originally, and we talked a little bit about this before we were rolling tape. Um, originally, Calton cases was started in the UK. Yes. And then in the, there's some <laughs> Canada gets involved somehow. So what's yeah. what's the story? So the timeline is Keith Calton, who is the originator in the UK. In the 60s, he was a musician. Folk world was big, and he had friends who were starting to tour and were getting their instruments destroyed. In his back shed, he was building, like dabbling in his in fiberglass. He was starting to build like little boats because he was a fisherman. And um, and a friend of his said, "Could you build a guitar case out of fiberglass?" Because we need something durable and uh and he did and that's what he did the rest of his life so he he built in his backyard all his life pretty much (laughs) five or six a week he started getting a lot of back orders a friend of his who was in canada said you know i would like to license the brand here and start building them in canada and that was Al Williams, and he was the one who really took off and made started making, cranking them out. He yep. had a big staff. He was at at the end of, of twenty years of him doing it. He was doing forty a week. Okay. And um. And so then. That starts to get serious. Then it starts to get serious, and then uh, they decided they were both going to retire, and they sold off to a guy in Canada, who just could never get it working and it kind of disappeared as far as manufacturing for a few years and then a friend here john green um had a calton case and called called keith about licensing it here keith was like why don't we just move it i'm not going to build anymore here in the uk just let's move it to to the states so we we so now, here. now this is the Calton 2013. Cases. This 2013. Calton cases. Not that long ago. Yeah. No, five years ago. That's okay. when I started. Uh, John brought me on. Yeah. And you guys are here. early on. You guys have a plant here and a really... So you've been here since the beginning? Yes. Okay. Yeah. You guys have a, a, a really cool manufacturing plant here uh, about probably five or ten minutes depending on traffic as a crow flies from downtown. Yeah. Yeah. East. And uh, in the east side here, the, the burgeoning... Uh, very exciting east side of Austin. Yeah, there's a bunch of really cool shops around us. Yeah, yeah, we <laughs> were just talking stuff. about some yeah. Fort Lonesome. Who, who else around here? Fort Lonesome. Then we have the barbecue place next door. The um, is that a lot of barbecue there? No, no, no. There's uh, it's the manufacturer. I, I'm sli- it's slipping my mind at the moment. Okay, they do sausages mainly. Smoky okay. Denmark's. Got we're, next, it. we're next to Smoky Denmark's. Okay. Um, yeah. And cool. then there's lots of nice restaurants kind of popping in over here. You and know. how many employees are here at Calton right now? We're running about 25. 25? Right yeah. Okay. So let's talk about American manufacturing, about what it means to make things here in the U.S. Because uh, your cases, um, we'll put that out there before our audience gets too excited. They are not what I would call budget cases. <laughs> they are definitely not budget cases. <laughs> right. So, I mean, what is MSRP on them? Is like a, over, it's over $1,000. It's 1200 for most cases, unless you want like a custom. Uh, we do like sparkle finishes. You saw a couple there. Yeah, the custom ones for an artist. For can we <laughs> yeah. can we name the artist or not? Uh, yeah, maybe. Maybe. Oh, no. Okay. Well, <laughs> an, unknown, an unnamed, well-known artist is having two sparkle models shipped to him in Nashville. Yeah, pink and purple. Thank you. There you go. And it's actually not. I mean, we're gonna keep nah. it. As a, we're gonna keep it as a mystery. But it's not the colors that you would pick if you heard this name. Yeah. Pink and purple are not the two colors that no, come to mind for me. Think of like American flag or black. Yeah. Black sparkle or something like that. Something dark. On fire. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, I mean, yeah, goes to goes to show, man. You never know what happens behind closed doors. Yeah. yeah. Um, Okay, so let's talk about American manufacturing. How do you compete with, uh, because a case that's made overseas probably costs 10% of that. 
there's a lot there's kind of a gap for the most part i mean there is some but there's like low end cases and then there's high end cases and there's not a ton in between that are even the in-betweens are kind of not meant for protection. They're just a little bit n nicer looking. Okay. But um, it's a small market in the high-end right. guitar case world. Because there's not that many people, I guess, net-net in the population that need... No. Uh, I mean, you think of the, the really, touring musician world is really small. Yeah. And, like, it, and really it really has to be a touring musician it. who has multiple guitars or checking into flights. Most of the time. I mean, we have a lot of people that just have one. Really? Well, I mean, I have a oh. lot of people that just like, this is the guitar I play. It's really the only one I really play live. And I, it's not even, you know, crazy expensive guitar, but it has to be in working order when I show up. And they tour a lot overseas, uh, not just in the States. So they can't, they can't have it be broken right because in the states you can check it but overseas is a little harder yeah i mean you can i'm sorry check yeah. it. you can uh, carry it on yeah and it depends and carrying it on the states is tricky too it's something that won't fit in the overhead a lot of times like the uh, smaller ones like the mandolins banjos but it, i mean yeah I, i've been i've traveled and in, in, in played all over the place and i think there, there are ways to make it work with most airlines yeah dreadnoughts but, you know, dreadnoughts, the dreadnoughts is like about the max you can like talk them into yeah <laughs> putting in the overhead they'll fit but yeah getting it getting it there is always tricky yeah for sure for sure and how, so you're saying that you were differentiated enough with your product that really uh lower cost competitors from overseas are not a concern for you right now they're not a concern uh and you know this case is built it's an expensive case but it's built to last decades there are there are still ones out there that are some of the originals that still are out there doing their job. Um, so as opposed to buying 20 cases over the lifetime of a guitar and having your guitar be in threat of damage at yeah. all times, uh, get this. You don't have to think about it for a long time. Yeah. Like possibly ever. And you're, your instrument's going to show up. Gotcha. And in this case, it's going to do its job. Cool. Tell me about, so five years is not that long ago. No. Tell me about the process. You guys have a great operation right now. You know, I can, I just, we just walked to the plant, like things are running. What is the process of starting a plant in a growing urban area? And what, you know, that, that seems like a huge challenge. It is a huge challenge. It's a huge challenge in, in Austin as well. It's pricey. Yeah. Uh, real estate's pricey. Um, just even supplying all the parts and all the the materials we need yeah. inside the states is, you know, some stuff I just can't get in the states. There's just some things that just can't come from here. Um, but m almost everything we get s s supplied in the states. But it's almost a full time job. <laughs> just to be <laughs> just suppliers. to manage and keep supplies flowing yeah. and keep uh, your switching companies. One company disappears, another one pops up, or you find someone who can make it better for cheaper. Uh, you're always, always looking. Yeah. Uh, so Would you say that's your biggest challenge? challenge. I, I think it's one of our biggest challenges. Is, yeah. is sourcing the parts and sourcing the supplies. The parts and keeping it, yeah, okay. keeping it flowing. And how do you address that? You, just have an like, you have an Excel spreadsheet where you keep track of all this? Uh, there's that and uh, yeah so it's a lot of expels ex it's a lot of spreadsheet and then it's also just a lot of in our heads at this point um, we know we're we're trying to like come up with a better system where a lot of times we're we're stocking too much like just because we can't run out of things we had a handle oh. situation where uh, weirdly, there's a guy in the in New Jersey who made manufactured leather handles for everybody, like everybody in, that makes a case. This guy was making the leather handles, and he passed away, and everybody was stuck, and nobody could figure it out. Wow! And big manufacturers, they're like, we have a stock for six months, so we don't have to, you know, we're not not shipping out product but, but the problem with that 
is that as every small business owner knows, that's cash on the shelf. It's cash on the shelf, so we can't have, you know, we're, we don't have the luxury of running, having like a year's supplies of anything. You know, it's like short, short supplies. Yeah. Because it'd be too much. How many cases are you guys cranking out right now? Uh, we, we generally run around the 20 to 25 a week. Okay. Trying to uh, ramp it up a little bit this year uh, and get up into the 40, back up into the 40 where Al Williams was. Uh, okay, so that would be a couple of thousand a year? Yeah, a couple of thousand a year. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so that's our that's our goal for 2019. Uh, we're making a lot of production changes on the floor just to, like, accommodate to be able to easily stretch or shrink um, what we do. To make things more on demand so you have fewer fixed costs. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Which is, that's a challenge for everybody, especially in manufacturing. Yeah, you, you've you seen, uh, you were here at the Fretboard Journal event, and I don't know how much of your memory it is, but it's completely, <laughs> it's completely different, all these tables that we oh, put yeah, out no, here, no. all these benches are... Yeah. Old and benches. even the space there, like they, where you had the performances, that now there's like some kind of furniture in there that I didn't remember. Yeah, and there will be a stage back there. We're we're still uh, we've moved a bunch of stuff in. Okay. Um, but we're trying to find all the space. So how that. are you? So how are you going to scale all these logistics challenges as you increase production? Uh, we're separating out production a little bit more. So instead of having someone who does this extensive yeah. piece of it we've, we've taken everybody and like given it smaller chunks so you're doing a smaller piece of that case it's like Henry um, Ford a little bit and so to be easier to train somebody to just like here come in and do these two things yeah. instead of like do these 42 things so it's um, like more toward an assembly line a little bit but it's also like everybody switches stations depending on what what needs the most work that day yeah uh, there's still everything every case is custom built specific to that instrument so we're still working that out of like really how do we make those fits perfect how do you do that do you send somebody something to trace your guitar and send it back right. yeah trace your guitar we have a form it's like fill out this form give us these measurements give us a tracing or come in we'll do it okay um at trade shows, we do it as well. We but like if you live in Japan, you can't really do that. No. But we also have uh, several hundred on file. I don't know if you saw the hanging templates. You did. Um, we have, you know, anything we've measured or gotten in, we keep. And trying to keep from, you know, running into times where we don't have a measurement for it. Yeah. So... So, and that's really important to have a tight fit between the case and the instrument. It's everything. Yeah, it's a perfect fit. You know, it just slides in. Yeah. There's no gaps. Um, so, that's a big deal, like having, like, very tight tolerances so the, in the instrument's not flying around in there. Yes. And it's a lot of padding as well, you know. Like, I have have many old cases of mine that are you know, maybe I, at the max a half inch of foam between oh well i mean i i play like, i play a yeah 63 gibson lg1 yeah. which came with essentially what is a cardboard case i have the lg2 from yeah. the 50s it's yeah it's yeah car, it's it's cardboard it's yeah, like it's even literally thin cardboard. cardboard it's literally card it's and it's uh i mean it's cute i guess but uh, yeah, it's not, i don't know what the purpose of those yeah, cases i don't know either. i don't i don't i don't use it i think it would be it was just to get it home i think i don't know i think it would be murderous i mean I, but a lot of people, so that's another, you know, a lot of people keep those old cases. It's a big deal for resale, right? So, like, they want to keep the old case in as nice a condition as possible. So, but they play the instrument. It's a vintage instrument. It's been played. They want to keep playing it. So yeah. they travel with a nice case. Right. They can take abuse and protect the instrument. But if they, it protects the resale. If they ever need to resell I, that I think instrument, kept, they could put it back in the yeah, nice I think original. I kept the cardboard one. But actually, I, I still probably, have it. Mine. I probably butcher. I think I butchered it and took, you know, that's got a little <laughs> Gibson brass plate? Yeah, I yeah. took that off and, and put it on that and another hard case. Because I was like, fuck it. Mine is literally falling. It's just barely holding on. Well, it's literally cardboard and thread yeah. made 50 years ago. Yeah. So, no. Yeah. Pass. It's a weird case. <laughs> 
So let's get into the fun stuff. Let's yeah, talk yeah. about the uh, you know the music scene here in Austin. You guys are a part of the community. We're talking about Fretboard Journal. Actually, and you happen to be personal friends with Dan Grissom, who yeah, yeah. is uh, a, a past guest of this podcast from Biscuit Press, and he did the poster for that event for Fretboard Journal. He did. He was the first person I met when I moved to Austin in 08. Uh, at a ca- at the Cactus Cafe. Oh yeah, I played that at the open mic. I rolled yep. in on, on Monday, Monday night. night. Yeah, with Casey. Yeah, yeah. And it used to be Dan and I used to host it. Nice. Was Graham Weber before us. Okay. And then Graham, when he was on the road, he he would hand it off to Dan and I, and Dan and I ran it for a little while. That's awesome. I I mean, I've only done it since Casey's done it. Yeah. Um, and at that stage is magical. It's, I mean, it's no, it's you so can magical. feel the ghost of Towns Van Zandt on there. It's a magical stage. It's one of my favorite stages. Yeah, play. and the sound system. Yeah, I mean, that's beyond the scope. And it's not. Let's not get too far off. But the sound. If you're ever in Austin, please do go check out the Cactus Cafe. It's a little bit off the beaten path. It's out in the uh, UT campus. You. Yeah. Hard to park there. Very hard to park there, and you wouldn't know it's there. Yeah, it's like you know. within the student union. It's, it's iconic, like a venue that is or should be known worldwide that is inside of the student union of a public university. <laughs> so weird. That, so I weird mean, it feels weird to even say that. <laughs> but yeah, very involved in the music community. I moved here for music. Yeah, same here. Uh, I've, I play around town. I, all my friends are either full time or close to full time musicians. Nice. And, uh, yeah. What do you play? I play guitar, singer okay. songwriter. Cool, man. Uh, yeah, three records out. Sweet. And, uh, and kind of how I landed into Calton was I was on the road. I did this like six week tour, and I was just looking for something to kind of get into when I got back in town, some kind of work. And uh, and I had heard my friend John had just purchased the company and was moving it here. I had a background in fiberglass from my childhood. Okay. Um, so I called him up and he was like, yeah, come out to the shop, let's have a beer, let's talk about it. And then I just started. That's started. awesome. We should jam some time, man. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, totally. I'm down. I, I, I think we live not too far from each other. So. Oh, nice, nice. So you can bring the dog. South Austin. Yeah, I yeah. to meet Muddy Waggers. Muddy Waggers is <laughs> the man. And Muddy Waggers goes to, I've been to quite a few podcasts. I didn't bring him today because I have to head uh, downtown after this. But. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Muddy, <laughs> Muddy Waggers is awesome. Yeah, I hear, his I hear. his dog and Dan's dog get along really well. Yeah, they do. Uh, yeah. That Buck's great. Yeah, Buck's awesome. <laughs> um, so let's talk about how do you want to uh, continue to build your brand and continue to be involved in the music community? Because maybe I didn't get invited, but let's see. The, 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 the Fretboard Journal is the only event that I've heard of being here, and I was that here. Was our, yeah, that was our first event. It's okay. the first time we've had, so we've uh, we've moved around Austin quite a bit because of the growth yeah it's hard to find industrial space here but uh this is the first place we've had where we had space to really host an event did you rent or buy this place we're renting okay i think yeah and um so this was the first time we had any kind of room most of the time we're just crammed yeah packed like the place we had before this one was like maybe like 20 20 percent of this like so small and um so we we hosted that event and we plan to get the stage back here when we get everything organized and start doing more events and more like touring stuff yeah. so like tiny desk concert kind that of vibe awesome. where it's like we have a lot of musicians who come in here to like pick up a case or bring one in that's an old one that they need a latch put on yeah re- put on or something like that and uh so we just want to do more pop-up shows really too yeah you, know? you so should get uh I mean, you probably know a ton of videographer. I got a couple of really good guys. Get people a video of those, and yes. then have that be part of your YouTube marketing strategy. Absolutely, yeah. So that's a big. So this, so 2019 is a big year for us. For the the biggest reason, I guess, is it's 50 years. It's our 50 year anniversary. Congratulations! Thanks, thanks. So we're really uh, Dan Grissom is designing a 50 year anniversary poster for Calton. Yeah. Uh, he's doing a few other marketing posters for Calton for the that were that are launching at the you're first lucky, of the year. You're lucky to be in touch with him. He's a fantastic artist. Ah, he's so good. I do a lot of so work good. at Radio Coffee, and uh, I see his stuff all over. Yeah. And he's uh, I also have his John Prine poster framed at my place. That's a good one. Did you see his new Metallica one? I saw it. Yeah, yeah. The one with the, uh, the what is it? It's kind of like a weird skull. It's a like, skull like coming out of a. a but it's robe. not. It's like an animal skull. With skull like snakes pouring out of the yeah, bottom. Yeah, it's oh, bizarre, so but awesome. 
Oh, yeah, I love it. Okay, so you were – well, I look forward to staying in touch about those events because those sound like yeah, a, lot, we'll have a, lot, a lot of fun. We'll do more. We, we want to do that fretboard journal yearly. Uh, okay. something we're trying to shoot for as well. They yeah. had a really great time. Yeah, I met some really cool people at that event. Some uh, funky so people showed up. This cat yeah. from Dallas who likes to uh, – I, I, my uh, guilty pleasure is to – I did 10,000 miles last year all, all over the oh, wow. country interviewing small businesses uh, for, for the show. And uh, my guilty pleasure is uh, going to pawn shops and going to uh, random like antique and curious stores. And yeah. finding old funky stuff, a lot of K's, airlines, and, uh, and harmonies and things like that, and then restoring them. So I have a shop in my place. Oh, wow. Um, but I met a cat from, uh, from Dallas, uh, E.B. Stewart, who he brought like that. Remember that there was like old Gibson, like L1 that, that was like floating around that oh, day? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I met, so you brought some really cool people together that day. That was a great event. Yeah. That's really we were really pleased with that one. Yeah. For being our first one, we were really. <laughs> it was. Everybody it was, was shocked. It was kick ass. Like, I loved it. Uh, great time. And then it, it was out. obviously our mutual friend Nick was here as well. So I ended yep. up hanging out with him a bunch. He was uh, episode, geez, I forget now, seven or eight. He was early on with Austin Vintage Guitars. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Love those guys. So what's, what's the craziest thing you've ever seen in your time here? Craziest thing. I do get a lot of very strange phone calls. Okay. Let's talk about that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's been my phone number on the website. Okay. It's like, if you need to talk about anything at all, yeah. call me. So I get a lot of random calls, and uh, it's usually on weekends. I get a lot of, I was driving one night, and I got a call from John Paul Jones. Mm-hmm. Um, and he calls, and, and uh, he's like, this is John Paul Jones. And I was like, okay. He's like, of Led Zeppelin. I was like, yeah, no, I'm aware. Gotcha. I got it. <laughs> and uh he's like i got this crazy instrument I, nobody can build a case for it and i thought if anybody can build a case for it it'd be you guys uh i've got this weird slide bass that has this triangle neck and uh it's just a weird thing let me send you some pictures so he sent me like a 50 pictures of this thing and uh, i was like yeah we can do it so he, it was like a purple purple instrument we did a a purple case and uh and basically just got a lot of measurements it was, it's a crazy instrument oh yeah. we actually have another one which is so random there's another one we're building one for that's not his that's in it's in the office right, right. now the instrument the actual instrument they oh, shipped us the instrument. i would on the way out i believe we i'll show you go one, check yeah. it out it's crazy that looking. sounds funky it's like this neck is like tri- a big giant triangle like, and it looks like it should weigh 400 pounds but it's really light it's it's weird that's crazy man um but a lot of a lot of weird calls of just people like uh that i wouldn't normally think i would be talking to you know they just randomly get calls yeah of uh i've had some of the guys at wilco in here and um i'll get a lot of really strange emails of of uh I got one actually from Jeff Tweedy, a Jeff Tweedy, not the guy from Wilco, but a Jeff Tweedy contacted me. He's like, I'm on tour. I need a case. Uh, can I come see you? And I was like, this isn't Jeff Tweedy. No way. So I like looked to see where Wilco was playing, and they were in Germany at the time. Yeah. And I was like, clearly, somebody, one of my friends is punking me because yeah. I'm a big Wilco fan. And so I just... Uh, I blew off the email for the day, and then I get an email from him the next day. And he's like, "Hey, I really need a case. I need to talk to somebody." So I'm like, All right, I call this guy and see who, see who he is. So I call him, and he's like, "Yeah, why didn't you call me yesterday?" I was like, "Well, I figured you'd just messing with me." Yeah. Because uh, Jeff Tweedy's in Germany right now. He's like, "Oh yeah, I probably should have mentioned that. I'm a different Jeff Tweedy. <laughs> I manage another guy, Damien Rice." So I was Dude, like, I "Oh, that, I like I know I like that Damien Rice." <laughs> Well, how do I know that name? Uh, he's like a singer-songwriter okay. that has a few records. Uh, they're amazing. He's an amazing songwriter. Okay. Um, but, yeah, he was like, yeah, I probably should have mentioned that. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can you think of a time when things went really wrong? And what would you do about it? Uh, really wrong. A lot goes really wrong here. Not really wrong, I suppose, because it's all fixable. Yeah. But, um we surprisingly don't get a lot of misfits. Uh, 
We'll get some that are damaged by a forklift. Like in transit, in travel. Hmm. Uh, really wrong. Uh, let's see if we had any... F a lot goes really wrong in the classroom. That's really the main place I would say things go wrong. What is the classroom? The classroom is the fiberglass room where we do like the mold, the exterior mold. We do it a fiberglass for the okay. most part. Um, highly flammable things in there. Oh. So you can over mix and get stuff on fire if you wanted to. We haven't had any fires, so Not that's good. Wood. But like, you can't be sitting in there working and, and look over and see like a bucket of resin like smoking. You're like, well, I should get that out of here. <laughs> Oh, Before shit. Before it starts getting too because hot. Because it could you self combust. Because you mixed a little bit too high percentage or something, and it could it could heat up enough to already catch fire. That is not an, <laughs> in, in a place in like In a flammable this. room, you know? So well, in a flammable like, room, in a highly flammable space. There's a ton of stuff in there. I mean, there's, there's the velour, the fiber. Yeah. There's a lot of shit that lights on fire. Yeah. So uh, that could get nervous, especially... If you've never run into it, so like most people who yeah. work in the glass room don't have a ton of experience. In the, you know, it's something you learn here, yeah, uh, for the most part. And so it's hard to like tell people like until you run into these scenarios. I can't really explain it. Just try to avoid Organ it. organic compounds are crazy. I mean, that's what it is, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's because crazy. Uh, for example, I I finish some stuff, uh, you know, with uh, wipe on uh, oil finishes sometimes, like true oil, which is yeah. And when you finish a guitar and like or the neck of one with that, you cannot throw the rag away because that's basically linseed oil. Yeah. And it can self combust. It can literally just catch on fire in your trash can. Yeah. And that's not fun. <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, let's see, anything really wrong? I had a guy, it was patience beyond me, I think. Th we had this guy in the UK who ordered a case, and um, he had ordered it. We had a sales rep here at the time who was a touring musician and kind of like would visit shops on the road. And um, while on tour, he, he got in a wreck and passed away. And this guy had put an order through him and then... The order never made it to us. And he waited about a year before he was like, hey, I haven't seen that case. <laughs> uh, any chance it's coming anytime soon? I was like, no, I don't even know what you're talking about. So he sent us measurements. Uh, we built a case. The measurements were wrong. We sipped in the case. The fit wasn't right. Mm. So I was like, ship it back. Ugh get measurements again and uh so it took us about a year and eight months to get a case of this guy that was working and uh he actually just ordered another one this was a couple of years ago but he just ordered another one okay like recently it'll so go, if things go much smoother if, if things don't go you know awkward like that what is the lead time for a case right now the lead time for a case right now is about a month okay that's not bad no we're down yeah, we, I, we we're talking about matt ike from mule and he's like a year out <laughs> oh yeah yeah we we've been up to uh we've recently da gone down considerably so it was running about eight weeks okay which is stretching it like people expect i think to like eight weeks is reasonable for most people in this industry to like wait for a custom build yeah handmade thing but uh but we've always wanted to be faster than than that so we're we're at about a month uh, we're hoping to get down to like two weeks if we can mm -hmm. we're really trying to um be fast fast and custom is kind That's of our tough. new yeah new it's hard to get too fast because you got to have a little bit of band you gotta have a yeah. little bit of you know orders fluctuate so like yeah. you gotta have a little bit of padding in there um, i had a i had a guest on the podcast uh uh jeff being helix metalworks in tulsa oklahoma yeah and he has a great sign on his uh in his shop that said what was it uh, fast cheap and quality pick two pick two yeah. right yeah yeah I, i've always loved that one yeah <laughs> yeah and is uh yeah it's true we put it on our instagram stories but uh yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, so you know, two weeks. We feel like two weeks is that's fast. It's possible. So Jesus. it's not like a. Right, right now, we're happy with them. That's like six sigma black belt stuff. <laughs>
Um, what's your number one piece of advice for people who are either running a small business right now or thinking about starting and running a small business you know, based on your experience here? Um, really be a workaholic, really. <laughs> it is a lot of work for yeah. anybody. Uh, love, you know, love what you want, know what you want to do and love it. Love what you do. Yeah. And, um, you just drove to San Antonio this morning, right? Yeah, I went to San Antonio this morning. We um, we have a new violin case that we're launching. So we haven't really been into the the um, s- the string market on the like cello, violin, like the orchestra side. Um, so we're we went to talk to a San Antonio owner who okay. owns like three violin shops in the area. That's probably a big market. It's a huge market. Yeah, and. Um, and it's a lot of expensive instruments that need protecting. Yeah, I mean, way more. Like the cheapest, nice violin makes the most expensive guitar to oh, have, like yeah, be like a I toy. Mean, I mean, you people get like their jaws drop. It's like, oh my God, it's a fifty thousand dollar Les Paul. But yeah, there's like, so like, I mean, what Yo Yo Ma's the, cello is insured for? I think what like three four million or something. Yeah, like that? it's like, it's yeah. I would say the volume of high end, high dollar instruments in the violin world is much more than it is in the guitar world yeah well some of them are hundreds and hundreds of years old right yeah yeah and super expensive and um, so we've been trying to we've, we've developed a case in that market and we're trying to like okay. get feedback basically so we went and met with the owner today and took a case and put an instrument in it and got feedback and uh, came back with some notes okay we'll take another stab at uh doing a few tweaks from what he told us to do and then we'll try it again okay and do you sell uh do you sell direct or do, do you because i've seen your stuff at uh, south austin music so you must have some dealers yeah we will it's primarily dealers okay primarily we dealers. um yeah i deal uh i do a little bit of direct but it's like out of the states it's just something that somebody I did in tasmania recently oh yeah it was more expensive to ship it than to make it to make it you know it was crazy and they were used to that and i was like you know it's gonna cost a lot of money to ship this and they're like yeah oh yeah yeah i'm aware wow but they wanted it so, and i don't even know how they knew about it you know tasmania uh, yeah some little island off the southern southeastern coast banjo, of australia a banjo case of all things <laughs> Dude, Tasmania and banjos. I'm moderately scared. Yeah, I don't know. Check into this. Yeah, there's a movie about something like that. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Where can people find you? People are interested in learning more about Calton cases and what you do. What are your social media properties? How can people find you? Uh, CaltonCases.com is the best place. That's C A L T O N. Uh, yeah, and a dash in between. Okay. Um, and we're on Instagram, we're on Facebook, very active on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, if you have any questions there, we're online. Just give 20, them a call. 24-7. Yeah. Uh, we're, <laughs> yeah. we're on social media all day and night just like everybody else. Right? And, so and like, if you call Calton Cases, you now know the person who will be answering the phone. Yeah, it's me. Awesome. <laughs> thank you so much for taking the time to share your story. Uh, thank you. I appreciate it. Take care. Small business war stories. Small businesses are the soul of America. And this is where they tell their stories. I am your host, Pablo Fuentes.